Welcome to the stage, Eric Meyer. Hi there. How you doing? Ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, Andy and Andy deserve a round of applause right now for an amazing show. So, hi. Wait. I have, it's not my clicker. I don't know how, clickers, how do they work? Anyway, I'd like to start with a very brief biographical sketch, which I promise is going somewhere. Um, I started out on the web on late 1993, when it looked like this slide that you already saw. Yeah, mosaic people in the house. Yeah. So uh, I was working at Case Western Reserve University, which is a university located in Cleveland, Ohio, and not a military college, as some of my high school classmates weirdly assumed. Um, at the time, I was a hardware jockey for a library infotech department. Uh, basically making sure that um, the, the, the online catalog terminals were working. Uh, one day between um, dealing with support tickets, a coworker, who's actually still a good friend of mine, showed me this new thing called Mosaic. And this was in the days of Gopher, which was basically a BBS on very slight steroids. <laughs> and I, I heard some Gopher people, also the days of the Cleveland Freenet. Any Cleveland Freenet users? Yeah. Yeah. There, there are. That's amazing. My people, well, come find me afterwards, we'll have a group hug. Um, Cleveland Freenet totally was a BBS. Um, but anyway, uh, he showed me this web thing. I was, I was instantly hooked, like, this is amazing. We could do so much for education and information. Like commerce didn't even enter into my head at that point. Um, and so uh, I started figuring out how to make web pages and I became, uh, I started a campaign to become the CWRU uh, campus webmaster. And this campaign succeeded because nobody else was mounting a campaign anything like that at the time. Uh, along the way, I, you know, I'm, I was trying to help departments get online, so I created this interactive tutorial on uh, how to write HTML. Um, and it got a few awards and got mentioned in a book. Uh, I wrote a couple of sequels that got into the more obscure corners of HTML. I later calculated that over the course of about Four years, probably a million people learned to write HTML on this tutorial, which in the late 1990s was serious traffic. And I got zero ad revenue, because there were no ads. <laughs> anyway, um, so in 1996, I first came across Cascading Style Sheets, CSS. And uh, it was, at the time, it was supported in two different browsers. Uh, in uniquely horrible ways. They were so terrible, but differently terrible. They couldn't even be terrible in the same ways. So I started publishing support information, this support grid. This is like the first version of, the, of what later became called the CSS Master Grid, to help other style-curious webmasters figure out what did and didn't work, basically sparing them of going through the process of, wow, the specification says I can do this. It does not work. Why does it not? Did I do it wrong? Right? Like, that was the question. Uh, am I wrong? Is the browser wrong? So I was trying to help people with that. That eventually led to me writing a bunch of articles about CSS and a decade of books on the topic and talks and doing consulting and training about CSS and all that jazz. In a sense, though, I never really stopped helping people learn. I never stopped writing tutorials, anyway, in a, in a sense. Um, so anyway, back in the 1990s, uh, I started writing little journal entries on my personal homepage at CWRU. <laughs> right? Back before we called it blog, before the word blogging existed. In fact, I remember when the big argument was whether to call it web journaling or web blogging. Uh, the correct side lost, as usual. <laughs> but, you know, there's my picture. We were bloggers once and young. Um, <laughs> And I kept up this habit uh, as I moved over to my own personal domain, which I got around 1999, uh, which at first was me literally hand-authoring static HTML pages and like editing them as I put in a new entry and copy, you know, select, cut, pasting into archive pages off the bottom of it. Uh, eventually I got smart and I started writing it all in custom XML, which I poured <laughs> through hand-authored XSLT scripts. I don't recommend that. <laughs> Uh, which turned it all into HTML. Then a few years later, I actually got smart and migrated to a CMS, in this case, WordPress. Um, and uh, let's see, come on, click. 
I kept up the blogging throughout the years, uh, sharing things I'd learned and thoughts I had about web technologies and standards and the events of the day. And of course, I eventually joined uh, Twitter and Facebook where I did all that same stuff except in much shorter chunks that were much easier to miss and almost impossible to discover later. <laughs> So it was natural to me that um, when four days after I took this picture of her, our daughter Rebecca was discovered to have aggressive brain cancer, that I took to my blog and my social media accounts to share what was happening. And at first I did it just for the simple act of, we could really use some support right now, right? Because that was then the most terrifying juncture of my life. Um, and I kept it up after the initial, uh, the, the initial stages of the situation to share what I was learning, to keep up to date people who knew me and cared about me and that I cared about and who cared about Rebecca, um, but also to open a small window into the life of a family that was going through this, um, having a child with a life-threatening condition that just to us came out of nowhere um, so that anyone who might come by and later might learn something from it or at least be able to say, yes, that is, I'm also going through that and that matches what I'm feeling. So I kept it up until I had to post her obituary nine and a half months later. And as part of that announcement, I included a note that was meant for those who would attend the funeral service. Because if there was one thing I could say with absolute certainty at that moment, it was at a sanctuary hall full of people, all wearing black, would have made Rebecca roll her eyes with impatience and boredom. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, uh, Matt Robin proposed that the web community get a hashtag trending on the day of her funeral, which combined a hexadecimal value for purple with her nickname, uh, a nickname which, somewhat ironically, I, I had never actually used with her. Um, everyone else did. I was the only one who ever called her by her full name. So my friend and colleague, co-founder of an event apart with me, Jeffrey Zeldman, picked up on the idea and he blogged about it, which pushed that far and wide sort of within the web design community. Uh, other people proposed coloring their social media avatars purple on the day of the funeral, which um, as it turns out, a lot of them did. But I found out later because they, they kept that going for days or weeks. And uh, the hashtag, as it turns out, I'm told anyway, did trend on Twitter that day, at least in the US. I don't, I don't know for sure. Um, Obviously, I had other things I was attending to that day. Um, so I also missed that on that day, the day of the funeral, there was a proposal made to add a named color to CSS equivalent to that 663399 in honor of Rebecca and her father's contributions to web design. So a few days later, uh, a few days after the funeral, the working group got in touch very gently and tactfully, um, to be clear, to ask my opinion and I told them that I could not possibly objectively evaluate the proposal and that I would accept whatever decision they came to, you know, pro or con, with one caveat. That if they did accept the proposal, and I was, to be clear, it would have been fine if they had said no. Um, the, the cliche, it's an honor just to be nominated, is not just a cliche, it's absolutely true, at least it was for me. Just that there was this proposal was more than enough. But um, I said, if you, if you do accept the proposal, I want you to just, I, one modification, which they did. The proposal was accepted by the CSS working group <laughs> and implemented by, in browsers within a matter of weeks. You can use this color today, which is how in a corner of the language that I devoted so much of my career to understanding and explaining, there's a memorial to my little girl, Rebecca Purple, which is equivalent to 663399. And this means I, it's impossible to describe, so I won't even try. But it was, I have to say, quite possibly the last thing I ever would have expected. Um, it was something I couldn't really process. And this is why, when the proposal was accepted, I barely even noticed, in part, because uh, that morning my wife's father uh, died unexpectedly, and I had to basically step up and carry the family while she dealt with that. Um, so besides adding the color to Rebecca's memorial page, uh, and eventually adding it later to a table listing all the CSS colors there are uh, that I'd made a few years earlier, I didn't really think about it much. Um, 
But I did come to think of it again uh, a few months later. And what pushed me to think about it was Gamergate. Whatever you might think about Gamergate, and there's a lot to think about it, but I think I can say at least this much without inaccuracy. Um, it pretty much took off when Adam Baldwin, previously mentioned, uh, coined the hashtag of Gamergate and shared some videos made by people who really didn't like Zoe Quinn. And then the whole thing blew up into what we now think of as Gamergate with a capital G. Uh, of course, in the process, uh, unfortunately, there were vicious, horrible threats and attacks against not just Zoe, but also Brianna Wu, or Anita Sarkeesian, um, other women, all of whom had experienced these kinds of threats in the past, but not with nearly the same intensity and, or frequency that was seen during Gamergate. As a, I mean, as a very part-time gamer, um, I, I, I felt like I was looking at this from the outside. I, hopefully, all of us did, um, in some sense. But when I find myself looking at something like that, something that horrible, I often take a step back into analysis. And I was already sort of in that place um, already because you know, I, was, I was trying to cope with, with everything that was going on. And I was seeing this happen because it just kept coming up in my, in my Twitter feeds when I would, or my Facebook feeds when I would go online to sort of you know, have just a few minutes of thinking about something else other than what was going on in the evening. This just kept coming up. And I, I just started to think about it analytically. This is just a thing that I do. Um, and what I sort of from that step back, I realized that I was seeing something structurally very similar to the 663399 Becca campaign. Because in both cases, you had a situation that already existed and it reached a sort of tipping point with the coining of a hashtag and the boosting of a signal by a prominent personality within a community. Um, in the case of Gamergate, that was one person, really. Uh, in the case of 663399 Becca, it was two people. But the same sort of process was happening that there was that sort of hashtag to give people a, a mimetic hook, and there was a call to do something, and then groups of people organized to do something. With 663399Becca, you had a collective tribute that gave way to a formal digital memorial. And with Gamergate, you had collective rage giving way to terrible real world consequences. Now, we often look at these things and we say, you know, the difference here is just the difference in input. You start with negative input, you get negative results. And you start with positive input, you get positive results. But that, that's part of the truth, but it's not the whole truth. There's nothing that guarantees that the kind of input you give will get the kind of output that, that you end up with. History is full of examples of people who did the right thing for the wrong reasons, or the wrong thing for the right reasons. So it's not just the input. It's also the medium in which these things are happening. We often say that the media and the services that we build are like roads, right? neutral to their uses. That is not true of roads, and it should not be accepted of what we create. Because yes, a ribbon of asphalt is neutral to its uses, and to, you know, to the extent that a ribbon of asphalt can be said to be you know, neutral to anything, but we are not neutral to the uses of that asphalt. We decide where and how a road should be built, which includes deciding who will have access to that road and who will not. Just by the process of saying this road will be built here and not there, that means that people there are less able to make use of the road than the people who are here. And there's no way around that, right? You, you can only, you can, like, the road has to go somewhere if you're gonna build a road. Um, but the act of deciding is still there, and the values, what, what was valued in the creation of that road is still implicit in its course. Furthermore, roads are not free-for-alls. Right? We as a society determine things like speed limits, and caution areas, and toll collection, and the general rules of the road. We do not allow people to drive on whatever side of the road they feel like, thereby endangering other drivers. We set much lower speed limits around schools. Uh, we paint lines to indicate where passing is permitted and where it isn't. Uh, hire policemen and judges to catch people who don't follow these rules and penalize them as necessary. We even require licensing of people before they can drive just to try to make sure they understand at least a bare minimum of the rules of the road before we allow them to use it. Now, I am not arguing that we should license internet use, as tempting as that might be sometimes. 
I'm pointing out that roads are not anywhere near as neutral as we all too often pretend. Nothing about a road is neutral except for the raw material. On it and around it, there's an entire set of values hovering like an aura. Design is a value statement. What we build and how we build it says a great deal about what we value and who we are. What we make easy speaks to what we value and what we make difficult speaks to what we reject. Software may well be eating the world, but we are shaping it, okay? What we do now, what we build, how we act, what we tolerate will profoundly influence how society develops over the next few generations. Not because what happens now will change you or me. Most likely, we are unlikely to change much. Most of us are pretty set in our ways. But our children are not. What they see online is going to seem normal to them, just as what we saw growing up seemed normal to us. So my growing up, effectively growing up blogging, meant that to me it seemed entirely normal to share what I was experiencing with Rebecca's cancer and her eventual death. Um, and that drew some criticism from people who grew up in, in an earlier era and were taught to keep things like bad news and bad feelings hidden away from the rest of the world. I'm not saying that the criticism bothered me. I mean, it was so alien to my way of thinking that it was as though they had criticized me for wearing blue while I did it. But then again, my actions were every bit as alien to their way of thinking. So, those of us who build systems of interaction have a unique responsibility because what we allow and forbid defines what we do at a level far more meaningful than branding. Okay, the shape of a system, of any system, says something very clear about the people who created that system and what they valued. To paraphrase uh, Bria Savarin, show me what you build and I will tell you who you are. Not done yet. And the thing about the systems that we build is that they are really easy to modify. They're really easy to make better. As an example, uh, Riot Games, League of Legends, which is, uh, which um, I think has been mentioned today, uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a PVP game and basically was infamous for the rank toxicity of its chat channels, right? Based, you know, you, if, if you were a new player and you got on, these games are long and you could expect for the entire length of the game to be abused in the most horrible ways, you know, ver verbally abused in the most horrible ways you can imagine just because you were inexperienced. Riot Games recognized that this was a problem. And so they set about trying to figure out ways to change it. They've done fantastic research and I recommend that you look it up. Uh, I, could, I could talk for 20 minutes just about all the, you know, some of the stuff that they did. Um, but from the outside, so there's not much real point in that, but they literally, they looked at things like how they worded chat prompts. They did, you know, controlled testing and what color they used for error messages and how that affected the toxicity of the chat. They have been changing their design because they realized that what they had designed did not fully reflect their values. And we can talk about whether those are business values or moral values or ethical values, but at the end of the day, what they are trying to do is improve their design. Uh, also in the gaming world, I don't know if any of you backed Eco. Um, so apparently someone did. This is a fascinating game. It's been described as a, as a cross uh, between uh, Minecraft and Rust. Basically, uh, it's a voxel-based world with a fully functioning ecosystem. And the players come into the world and they can harvest stuff and craft stuff and establish an economy. Uh, they have to hunt, but the thing is if they overhunt, then the food stocks collapse and everyone dies. Um, if they uh, fell too many trees, then the forests don't grow back fast enough and they, and they get uh, resource constrained. If they build technology, the technology spreads pollution nearby from runoff. But there's an asteroid on a decaying orbit above the world, and so they can't just sit around forever in a verdant pastoral setting and not ever pollute anything. They have to figure out how to make their way forward and not have everyone be wiped out one way or the other. And uh, the, the promise of the game is that if a world is destroyed, it is literally erased from the servers. It is gone forever. So there's, it's a fascinating design. 
they're still working it out. They actually, they introduced a reward tier that they then withdrew. And the re reward tier that they, they established was if you pay this enormous amount of money, then, uh, well, enormous, $5,000, which is pretty enormous for a video game, but if you, so if you paid, I think it was $5,000, uh, then your player account in Eco, would, uh, you would have a special thing that allowed you to just call down the asteroid whenever you felt like. This was immediately dubbed the Rich Troll tier. <laughs> and Strange Loop Games, the creators of Eco, uh, have said, okay, yeah, no, we're not gonna do that. Um, but we're th they are th they're still thinking about ways that players can affect the world uh, in just beyond local ways. It's fascinating, they're, they're, creating, um, they're creating a canvas, but at the same time, there are value statements all through this design, just from the fact that building technology causes pollution. That's a, that's a value statement. We might, you know, we can say, well, that's totally reflective of the real world. Yeah, video games not noted for their total reflection of the real world, <laughs> right? Um, you know, they, we'll see if they introduce the ability for players to kill each other. If they do, that's one value statement, and if they don't, that's a different value statement. Not necessarily better or worse. I'm not, the point here is not, you know, this set of values is ultimately objectively superior in all cases, and this is always wrong. No, the point is that our designs are value statements. And if you want to design a system where it's just people beat the crap out of each other and hurl magic missiles and drop nuclear weapons, that's a value statement. It speaks to what you value in a game. If eco goes completely the other way and it's all about cooperation, that's a different value statement. But with our designs and with the things that we've built, there has not been a lot of thought to the value statements we're making. And that makes some sense. When, you, when we started out, it was hard enough just to get people connected. Never mind what they could or couldn't do afterwards. So the way that we build our networks matters in the most profound possible way. And to consider two extremes, if we build networks that make it easy to abuse and harass, and make it difficult or impossible to defend against that abuse or harassment, our children will come to see that arrangement as normal or even desirable. Similarly, if we build networks where it's hard to abuse and har harass, if it's hard to mount those sorts of campaigns and it's very easy to defend against those sorts of attempts, that becomes the norm. So in 2035, will we think it's acceptable, for example, to mute or block people who are trying to communicate with us that we've never heard of before? And that might seem like a completely ridiculous question to ask, but if networks make it harder to mute and block, then the answer to that question could change. Our grandchildren might think of the act of blocking as completely quaint and archaic. Or they might come to think of our current situation as unthinkably permissive and damaging. And if social networks make it easier to block harmful feedback and they make mounting those kinds of attacks more difficult in the first place, then the answer to the question might change to the point that nobody even thinks to ask the question anymore. The ability, the ability to mute or block could just become absolutely unquestioned, the same way that none of us woke up this morning wondering what side of the road we would drive on. So how we build these systems matters a great deal to the future, just as Zoe was saying. If we build these things in a way that encourages uh, positive collaboration and discourages destructive attacks, that influences anyone who uses and more importantly grows up with that sort of system. And because there's no truly meaningful distinction between online and offline, whatever they come to accept as normal online will seem just as normal offline. Because system design is always, always social design. The question is, what kind of society do we actually want to design? What do we want our future to be like? Is it gonna be communities who work together or camps who tear each other apart? I mean, both are always gonna happen. The question is really, which is the norm? Will our societies, will we ourselves become more constructive or more destructive? And because we are, we're building like crazy. It's far past time we started building wisely with a thought to what we want to say about ourselves as well as what we want the future to be. And that's what I came here today to urge you, all of you, to do. And I ask you to do this um, not in Rebecca's name, but in the names of Rebecca's brother and sister and all of our children who will ultimately live with the consequences of our construction. Build in their names. Thank you.